Hello and welcome to the Body Meets Mind podcast, a philosophies and strategies for an elevated life. My name is Paulie and this is Tom. How are you, buddy? Mate, very good. I think today we'll uh, we'll probably be really honing in on the philosophies for an elevated life. Um, maybe some strategies, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're getting into the, the deeper roots today, I think. Very cool, which leads us to our incredibly wonderful guest, Menachem Wolf. I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show and having a bit of a yarn to us. My pleasure. Really happy to, to be here. Yarning. Yarning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Menachem, tell us a little bit. Uh, firstly, uh, I, I want to just lay a little bit of a uh, background as to mine and your relationship uh, We've known each other for some time. In fact, you married myself and my wife. Would that is that true or is that not true, Menachem? <laughs> um, that is very true. And as my kids uh, like to laugh, I've married many people in my life, <laughs> and I, I, f- I feel that way. I feel that there is an intimate uh, bond that's built when you get involved in someone's wedding. But yes, mm. I I, uh, I I confess this you is con- true. <laughs> you confess. Um, yeah, it's it. It's still really like some of the conversations that we had uh, pre and post wedding still resonate and remain kind of as anchors in mine and and Nat's kind of conversation and relationship, uh, which is which is really great because the reference point that we've had uh, has still remains really really uh, kind of vibrant in mine and Nat's relationship. Excellent. That that's all I can ask for. Yes, exactly right. And, um, you know, so you've been present in my life. Um, I'm obviously Jewish uh, and, you know, you've had that kind of link uh, and aspect for me personally. But, Tom, I'd love for you to kind of uh, offer a kind of uh, perspective as to how you're coming into this conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, Menachem, thank you so much for for joining us on the show first thing, mate. Um I suppose my perspective, I've always been very interested in in religion, meaning existentialism. Uh, I was raised a Catholic. Um, I, I my my uncle is a brother, um, and um, he uh, a lot of my family's from from Adelaide. But religion, spirituality is uh, has been in my life uh, since since the dawn. Um, the context for me, mate, is that I actually I developed a real fear around. Um, eternal hell this idea of what i thought was eternal hell as, as a young kid you don't really go into the more psychological components of that until you start inquiring and living a more reflective life um so i became really nervous about that um and then as a result i did a 180 and fell in love with atheism which was a very clear avoidance strategy <laughs> so i um fell in love with dawkins i was almost flying a flag you know loving all this stuff um yeah you, you know you became religious <laughs> well that's you became exactly, a religious atheist i really did i really did that's exactly right and and i think um in becoming a, um more interested in some of the philosophies of religion um and 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 trying to cultivate my own spirituality which which honestly just began as a way to learn more about who i am and my place in the world i started to really fall in love with some of these ideas that were inherent not only in catholicism but also in judaism and buddhism and hinduism and these these ideas around morality um and pro-social behavior that have been around for thousands of years so i think for me um hearing from you and and what you've learned uh, you know, with being so versed in just one of those particular religions is going to be just really, really beneficial. And I'm so excited by it. And I actually have a question as a, as a, um, to run off that. Um, I remember, uh, reading a, a study a couple of years ago about, um, this dichotomy of religion and spirituality. It seems that a lot of people in the West, um, especially in the younger generations are becoming less religious, but more spiritual. And, and as someone who has um, mm-hmm. got a couple of anchors in, in both of these fields with, with Spirit Grow as well that we're um, Paul and I are excited to talk about, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that and, what, and, and why you think that might be the case and, and what people are getting from spirituality that perhaps they're not finding in religion and if we can bring those two together and, yeah. Okay. It's actually a... Um... It's a very, very good question. 
Um, not that you need me to tell you that's a good question, but I say that it's a question that many people are asking and some are asking because of market research. They need to know why so that they can alter and tailor their, their product. Mm. And to others like, like yourself and, and myself, this is a, this is an intriguing concept because for most of the past uh, couple at least couple thousand years, religion has been the backbone and of, er- of everything. And however we want to define the West, um, it has been religious more so than spiritual, at least how we may think of it. That's not to say there wasn't a spirituality within the West, but um, all right, we'll come back to that. But so, so to your question, it's it's a really it's an intriguing one. I'm not a social scientist. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a anthropologist. So I'm going to put forward an idea. But it's my idea, it, or, or it's informed from other ideas. But it's not a, it's not a, an educated idea by certain standards. But this is what I see, and this is what I think, and also somewhat what I experience. And that is, religion has become uh, very dogmatic uh, and and very authoritarian, and it has become very process oriented, and it has. I, when I say lost, the religion may not have lost, but the communication of the religion and the practice of the religion has lost its spirituality. So what is it trying to achieve? So if we could, if we could just jump over to America, because I think America is an excellent metaphor for religion, um, where you've got many, many people who believe in the religion of the Constitution, um, but are they really delving into the deeper meaning of the Constitution? So there's this whole religion around guns and the right to own a gun, bear a gun, carry a gun, whatever it is, and, and get into the literalism or the interpretation of the of their constitution. But can we just go back a step to what was it that the people who wrote the constitution actually wanted to enshrine? What was the spirit mm-hmm. of why people should be allowed to carry weapons? What was it that they were afraid of? What was it they wanted to empower society with? Now, I'm not going to get into that any further, but it's a good example of where there's a lot of debate around the religion, the law, but there isn't much debate as to is the spirit of that law still relevant or not. Mm. And so many religions have become like that, where you have to do, you have to do, you have to do. Um, but why? And and what is the religion's belief? What is the religion's view of the world? What is the purpose of reality? And often these questions get uh, trivialized and boiled down into do good, don't do bad and things like that, and just get on with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So with the rise of spirituality in the last uh, 70 years, so you go back to the 60s, there's this incredible spiritual revolution that um, has winds from the East. So the Eastern traditions of of Hinduism and and Brahmanism and and Buddhism and and, and other isms that, that come along. People start discovering meaning and purpose. And as that keeps filtering through the 60s and the 70s and a bit of the 80s and 90s, well, let's just do 60s and 70s, there is this purpose, there is a meaning, there is a tranquility that a, there are systems out there that are offering that don't at all sound or resonate like the conventional religions, be they the Judeo-Christian or, or contemporary philosophies of the day. Mm. Then you go through the 80s and 90s, and there are a whole lot of scientists who are putting these spiritual systems through the ringer and going, oh, my gosh, this is so healthy, like meditation and et cetera. And so we get this westernized version of Eastern tradition. And as that becomes something that it's healthy, it's good, it's stress relieving, you will feel better. Well, that is always going to appeal to our more animalistic side where I want to feel better. So if you're telling me spirituality will make me feel better, well, one plus one is going to equal two. Mm -hmm. And so you have both a sincere drive towards spirituality as well as, I wouldn't say an insincere, but I'd say a more self-oriented drive towards spirituality where it's better for me. Either way, that's good. And so we fast forward another 20 years into the 2000s and 2010s and, and now into the 2020s. Um, and we've got this rise of meaning, and 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 feeling good now spirituality though goes well beyond uh, uh the spiritual systems of the east when we talk about spirituality today i presume we mean everything from environment to 
doing good by the and and representing underprivileged and wanting to correct uh, um, the loss, the, sorry, the injustices in the world, all the way through to Eastern tradition. And so it's a big lump sum yeah. of, I would say, it's a big lump of uh, tangible altruism where people would say, oh, if I do this, I can see it's doing good. I feel good about that. Whereas the old religions, the old religions or the religions that they've become have become very much about, but you've got to show up, you've got to do, you've got to show up, you've got to do, but there isn't a lot of why. So mm. you're telling me I've got to do, I don't see the impact. How does... How does, I don't know, shaking a palm branch if you're a Jew, what good is that doing for the world? Or uh, um, how is not eating meat for a month in the year, what good is that doing for the world? And so the religious systems, which actually have very complex, beautiful, sophisticated spiritual systems, are being lost to a very easily accessible uh, sense of meaning and purpose and a sense of meaning and purpose that is proven to be healthy. So we don't have as many studies saying, being a a a catholic or being a jew or being a, a protestant is, is actually good for you even though i'm sure there are plenty of studies that could prove that so i think we've got this rise of spirituality because uh it, it has had this natural uh charm and and an ability to connect with and with that the natural openness people have has led to has led people to explore mm, mm, uh, yeah i really i really I like just intuitively agree with that. And I think I, uh, I'm almost frustrated by my, um, cause I went to a Catholic school and, and I, um, I, thank you for that. Cause I've never really heard someone say, and that's, ex it was exactly my experience. It was do this, do this. And no one could ask, no one could tell me why, because they themselves had been told to just do it, do it, do it. And no one really, you know, and, and I, I, I listen to a lot of religious based podcasts that give me that, that, um, that those answers, you know, and one of the greatest ones was just going back and learning about some of the psychological significance of the Old Testament as an example, and understanding what the hell the Garden of Eden is all about and the fall into painful consciousness. And I can, you know, remember so many moments in my life where I've learnt about an objective truth that is difficult to acquiesce to, that then as a result has made me more of an individual, more of a man, more responsible. Um, and, and that metaphor was one of the first books in a, in a, in a book that, um, I spend a lot of my earlier years, uh, afraid of, and I, and I am so happy to be alive right now because I have access to these, to these books and these podcasts. And I also now wonder if that I had, uh, a mentor or an influencer or a teacher who was talking to me about the, the, the morality in these, uh, parables and Cain and Abel and, you know, resentment being going down one way and, 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 you know, um, what Abel was doing being something else, it would have really helped. <laughs> so it, it's interesting. Yeah. So uh, you've said a few things that have like just gone. It's fire. I've got neurons firing all over the joint now. <laughs> um, uh, um, without wanting to sound judgmental or, um, pompously academic, which I can do very easily. I, I lapse into <laughs> sn snobbish conduct. No, but I, I, again, I don't have evidence for what I'm saying. I, I, I can only say this anecdotally. People have a fear of being wrong. And the, you know, the, the phrase don't throw good money after bad is a phrase because obviously most people do throw good money after bad. And as we spend, as we spend more time defending and believing in something, the more we want it to be right. And so I think we've, we're, we uh, have been educated by a generation of people who may not have been given the opportunity to have a choice uh, or to explore, and we're told that they have to accept something. So by the time they're um, of a mature age, uh, they have to defend their beliefs. And if you ask a question, you may be uh, um, threatening their beliefs or causing them to feel like you're going to depart and that would be a failing on them if their descendants if their children if their students reject their beliefs um or they don't have the answers and they're embarrassed or or so there's a whole host and therefore the need to transmit the message has become very paramount in many many different faith-based traditions but um and with that at the same time to defend it and protect the religion from 
anything is shut down the questioning. It's mm. not an intentional shutdown, but it's a natural reaction. When you don't, when a teacher is asked a question, they don't know the answer. You can either say, I don't know, but vulnerable is a popular thing today. You know, Brené Brown didn't live in the 1960s. So we didn't yeah. do vulnerable then. We didn't do vulnerable in the 19, especially in the 1980s, 90s. You know, authority knows all. And in the 80s, there was a, there's a rise in authority. I mean, there's some fascinating studies about policing and, and government involvement uh, in the 80s and how people want that. You know, that whole, when we were kids, we used to play in the street until the sun came down. Our parents didn't know where we were. Yeah, that was in the 50s and 60s. In the 80s, you didn't go to the park without telling your mum exactly where you were mm. and what time you'd be back. And if you weren't back in the 90s, you were going to be absolutely uh, uh, punished. Yeah. So there, there is that whole authoritarian uh, transmission. So, uh, um, so that that that's speaking to one thing about what you said, which is how the education that we got in a religious context doesn't seem to have that engagement or that mm -hmm. vulnerability. And there's also this need to protect the religion, as if the religion needs us mm -hmm. to protect it, as opposed to the religion being a guide or the spirit or the religion being a spiritual guide for us that can inform. So there's this idea of a mentor. And, and there's an old um, Jewish teaching, I say, Lecharav, make for yourself a mentor, a master. This is not a this is not a, 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 a master from an authority, but actually a spiritual, social mentor, someone you can bounce off. And to be a mentor requires that you can empathize with the person you're mentoring and be very human. So if you don't know the answer, you're allowed to say, I don't know the answer, because that gives the person permission to grow. Because you're not this idyllic, impossible character, this oracle, but actually you're just you're a senior person to that person. You may be younger, but you're you've got seniority in life experience. And mm -hmm. so to mentor uh, and to deliver the message and then say, well, this is what I believe, and these are the teachings of Cain and Abel or the Exodus, or whatever. And you can draw a philosophy from it. Uh, and I'll, I'm sure we'll come back to this. For me, it goes beyond that. It's the spiritual messaging that comes through but then the practices become so much more mm. uh and they become a wisdom that can inform our choices rather than uh, um dogmas that we must align with for social belonging mm -hmm. you know you have really examined this i feel at least from my perspective uh over the many years even decades that i've kind of had a perspective on, you know, spirit grow and how it's evolved. It seems like uh, a number of years ago, you've developed this, um, this system, which, which really was quite unique uh, for, uh, you know, like, like a Jewish um, religious vehicle uh, for you to be able to express. How was it expressing the way you thought about religion when you decided to kind of flesh out spirit grow to the wider community when you first started that process i'm smiling because it's a very uh uninspiring in uninspiring and in a thought inauthentic uh, beginning so <laughs> so uh i'm picturing there Tiananmen was no Square moment and... on the mountain it was quite uh, <laughs> i know i look at the people in Tiananmen Square and i just say run <laughs> There's a tank coming. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, that's that's me. I'm um, I don't I I admire the people that have the guts to do that. I I I don't believe I have that. Um, so I grew up in a in an observant Jewish home. I went to an observant Jewish school. I had observant Jewish friends, and I didn't have too many issues with it. I would call call that socially orthodox or socially observant. So. I maintain the social status quo of my peers, my circle, because why not? We're all happy. Um, we'd go to synagogue on a, on a Saturday and we'd catch up and we'd schmooze and you, you can you can look the part, but you just catch up and if if you know you, you're doing it, you go to school and you learn stuff. And I didn't, I wasn't a strong student in school in any subject. So Jewish studies math sciences it's all the same to me it's just like in one ear out the other fail the test move to the next year level um so i just went along with it and 
um, in short, my my desire in life, if you would have asked me at age 19, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have told you very sincerely, I want to be rich. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, I, and I wanted to be involved with charity and community work as far as being a patron goes. That would be about as close to doing good as I would get. I would support important causes. But I wanted a very hedonistic, um, comfortable life. I didn't come from a poor home. My parents both worked. Uh, I had a bed. We had food. We went on a holiday uh, during summer, somewhere in Victoria, all very good. So it's not like I aspire, but like I just hedonistic, selfish. Um, and fast forward a few years when Spirit Grow started, I wasn't that, it's something more that my father gave birth to. And he asked me whether I wanted to be involved. And I said, yes, because I did believe in it. I believed in the importance of it and I wasn't doing anything else. Um, I just become a rabbi. I just been ordained. And, and even I didn't get ordained because I was going to go that path. It was just something to do. I know it sounds weird, but it's like doing an MBA or whatever, or doing law. I might use it as a stepping stone to something else. So I didn't have any great aspirations or anything. And then when Spirigo started and I was involved and I'm teaching, I had the knowledge. And to be very honest, I was a cocky bastard. I knew that I knew more than most of the people in the room on the subject matter I was speaking on. So I wouldn't prepare classes any more than just give myself a quick structure of what I want to go through. But I wasn't respecting the participants in a way that I would actually uh, uh, want a teacher to respect the participants. I was like, give me a topic and I'll teach it. No worries. And uh, and I did that. But it was as people would ask questions and as I was mm. having more authority in in these in teaching and, and more programs that I was responsible for, I had to start opening books again and learning. And, and a few things led to another where I started – where I believed in what I was talking about, but again, I don't think it was deep down me. It was just something I was good at. Mm. So fast forward a couple of years into Spirit Grow is when things started clicking within me. Um, I grew up with meditation. So when I was when I was nine, when I was eight, we were driving to Byron Bay. My father was delivering meditation workshops and we'd sit in the back of the of the room. Like we grew up with it. We were around it. It was there. Um we would imitate it like close your eyes like when i was 10 we could we would joke like we'd have guests at the shabbos table guests at the friday night dinner table and and i and and at some point i knew i i could find my moment to make the adults laugh and i just say to everyone okay close your eyes and i could do a full meditation like so so it all was quite easy more so than natural um and but it was as things started I suppose everyone matures, especially in their 20s. We start maturing. And I, uh, there were a few things that led to a realization that spirituality is not an academic subject, which it had been until then for me. I've got plenty of books on spirituality. I'd read them. I'd studied them. But actually turning it into a personal spirituality, a, a framework for living, it's like I'm short-sighted. I put on a pair of glasses one day. And things look different. And I didn't want to take them off, even though I was getting a headache. Like I had to get used to it, but I didn't want to take them off. And then came the desire to want to share that perspective with others who were seeking that. So not so much as everyone's got to know this, but more that it, there are many pathways, many ways to wear glasses, many different glasses to wear. This might actually fit really well for some people. And I started actually experimenting with Judaism, meaning. I no longer was doing it. I was no longer spiritually exploring for the sake of it or for the or because of my role. I was experimenting with what this felt like. And 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 it went in interesting places. Like it, it was pretty trippy at different points without any drugs or alcohol. Um, just d- different meditations and different subject matter. At one point, my wife was even, she was a bit concerned. Like uh, well, she was more than a bit concerned. Like what's going on here? Like, and she wasn't sure, is this just like one of my things? Like, oh, yeah, I get into different things. Or is am I taking a hard turn here and, and, and evolving? So it was really, really interesting. And then coming back and settling, uh, um, that has informed a lot of what Spirit Grow is. And so Spirit Grow is very different in that you have many spiritual centers that may be run by Jewish people. But I, I take a very... Uh, a very serious, uh, I'm very I'm seriously respectful, and and I implement the lifestyle of Judaism 
but I and I and I in a very very uh, strict way because I see that as the lifestyle that that uh, it, it is the it is the way to implement the spirituality. I want to live with it, so I need tasks. I need activities and that is what life is life is a series of postures if it's a bit like yoga yoga is more than exercise yoga is more than building core strength it is a posture now it could be for some people it is exercise it is breathing it is stress relief it is it is building flexibility and 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 inner strength but actually yoga is so much more that's like incidental it's it's a deep mystical spiritual uh system and so i'm i adhere to the jewish tradition in a very uh orthodox way if you will uh because i i want the spirituality to, to permeate every aspect from every chewing of food through to the way i i rise from my bed in the morning to the way i uh, conduct myself with my children uh, and and that sounds all very ideal i should say i try i yeah. try but i want that in every aspect of my life and so the mm-hmm. jewish religion is offering a posture for the jewish spirituality and I think all religions should do that and are that. And maybe in the 21st century, we're ready to teach people about a spirituality that they go, oh, that sounds cool. Oh, do you want a posture for it? Yeah, some will say yes. And some will say, no, thanks. I'll make my own up using the philosophy and spirituality you've given me. Thank you very much. And we've got to be open to both. Mm. How how does um, Judaism um a help you with your is, is, is that there's that expression where it's like um uh the the concept or idea of god um uh keeps us hidden away from the direct experience of god um where it's like you can you can touch a concept but unless you have that true um intuitive experience direct experience either through a spirituality or some sort of psychedelic journey or solitude or whatever it is you can't ever know it but i uh, I've kind of got two questions for you, Menahem. I was wondering how Judaism helps you specifically with your spirituality, and then also how does Judaism um, distinguish itself from perhaps other main religions, um, even in the Abrahamic tradition? I'll start with the first. Sure. <laughs> the second one is touching on a theological, and while I may have read a few books and I love it, it's not necessarily my strength, but we'll see what we can produce sure, sure. on that. <laughs> I got a lot so of questions. <laughs> so let, the first question was, remind me. So yeah, how does Judaism how, uh, help your spirituality, your direct experience with God? Okay. Um, it's This is how it is for me. And there is no one path of Jewish spirit. Within Jewish spirituality, there are many pathways. Some may even contradict each other. But ultimately, they are all correct pathways. Um, so you can't turn right and left at the same time. But when you're driving a car, both right and left are legitimate turns. So, and and so the pathways don't all sit nicely with within each other, but they all operate within uh, this rubric of Jewish spirituality. Uh, so I will. I can only represent a a particular few of which there's one in particular. But I. I I can't say I haven't dabbled in in other things. Not that there's anything wrong, but it feels a bit, you know, almost I'm making it sound blasphemous to dabble in your own religion. Anyway, um, (laughs) um, so we're very, very fortunate that there is this very strong value in the Jewish tradition in academia and, and writing things down and that there is an academic process because that means there's plenty of material to read plenty of material to, to, to consume and plenty of material to find your, your, your pathway within. So the particular schools of spirituality that I've studied and continue to study and continue to immerse in are, one, are ones that, that drive the, the student to seek out the godliness in everything, what we might call the soul, what we might call the infinite, because it's important when we talk about God, I don't mean a, a, a humanoid character. God is, does not have a beard. God is not masculine. God is not an entity that's out there. All this is within the infinite energy and consciousness that we can call God. So it's not the universe, which is a common term nowadays. People say they put it out to the universe. The universe is limiting. No matter how you want to define the universe, 
it's limiting. Is it a physical universe? Is it a metaphorical universe? When we talk about God, we're talking about the universe is just a speck of possible reality within an infinite consciousness that is present in the microbe as well as in the macro. Mm. And so the spirituality is to, to, to seek that out, to see it. So it's to see it in time. It's to see it in objects. It's to see it in people. It's, and, and so empathy and love are very powerful ways to connect and feel. How do you feel someone else's emotion? They're not your emotions, but you can. Mm. There is this non-tangible way of building a bridge. And so what if we can go beyond that? Mm. And so the spiritual texts uh, will provide meditations and ideas, really well-developed uh, ideas that slowly help you stretch your brain to think differently. So much like if you study physics, so you do a month of physics, you do a year of physics, you do five years of physics, your whole world looks different. So, you know, a physicist walks yeah. into a room and goes, oh my God, there's there's light waves and particles. And I love how that's absorbing that and it's reflecting that and the tension of this, like they're just blown away by reality because it's a, because of what they know is happening in front of them. So if spirituality Spirituality is much like that, where it's stretching the, your perspective, with where you're going well beyond just sitting silently into actually viewing everything. And um, so, so it's not just how you view, but then your practices of life become ways to engage. So mm. the purpose of Judaism is to is to is that a person should be able to connect, or be able to be find a path to connecting and seeking the spiritual energy that resides within everyone and everything. Mm. Yep. Everything else is practice of how to do that. Mm. So our dietary laws, the way we eat, it's because I can connect with certain things through this mode called eating. I cannot connect with certain things through the mode of eating, but I can wear them or I can look at them or I can sit in their shade or whatever, and I can appreciate them and also respect their soulful origin and now it's not just in this two-dimensional oh everything has a soul but actually starting to think about the world as a manifestation of a spiritual reality and just thinking about the process how does the concept of a reality become a reality and then actually become like a phone a tree a bookshelf how has that become and just to be blown away by the magic of it all not mm. in, not in a supernatural magic but you know the excitement of it all Mm. And so now when you start living like that, things get pretty good, like good and bad pain and, and comfort become secondary. And now, but the goal is not to run to the mountain and, and, and become a, a, a monk and, and live at the top and immerse yourself and, and escape into that spiritual realm, but actually to come back from the mountain and see that in play in the physical tangible and to bring your consciousness on board, to bring your animalistic desire on board, to, to reform and to refine, I should say, to refine self, to refine the world around us. That is much more profound. And that's the goal. It's not enough to have discovered it. We've got to bring it all the way into the physical tangible here and now. And that's what life is for me. So in the workplace, mm. family, this, everything. And sure, sometimes I'm an absolute glutton and I just want to eat because I'm hungry and I love the taste of it. And sometimes I can practice a bit of restraint and then get in the restraint to, hey, hold up that gluttonous thing and just get into the headspace of this is bread. This, this is wheat. This is water. This is an incredible product that someone has labored. There, there is a soul that has been reincarnated into the kernel that I'm about to eat. And am I going to consume that and I'm just going to crap it out or am I going to consume it and its soul and my soul are going to become one? Mm. And the water and the, and the meat, it was a living animal. And, and, and then it died. Did it die because of uh, unethical behavior and because I'm hungry or did it die because it lived and now I can take it to a step further? What does a step further mean? I can help an old person cross the road because I have the energy to carry their bags because I ate a meal for breakfast, which was an egg or it was a sausage or it was a salad or whatever. And now that, 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 that cow, that carrot, that granule of, 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 of um, grain, that, that, that molecule of water 
is not just a molecule of water. It is helping an old lady cross the road. Mm -hmm. And to hold that in your mind all the time, it can make you go nuts, but hold it in your mind a bit of the time and it can make us really altruistic. Mm -hmm. I love that. Did you have a part B there, Tom? That I did. Was, I, I, I think I just got lost in the moment. I was really, yeah, I so, never thought so, of it like so that. was I. <laughs> it was, no, it was a, 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 amazing, something to, to really, really tangible to chew on as well. Yeah. Yeah, if I could just tie it back, because I, I presume, Tom, you're also in, in the health world, like Paul is. Yeah, um, so I work as a counsellor. Okay, so, so, so let's just take both of you as examples. So where exercise, what is exercise? Exercise, health, fitness well-being is about looking after the body that is the expression of my soul mm. if i'm a if i'm a zlob that can't get off the couch um and i do nothing to change my well-being then i'm actually preventing my soul from fully expressing itself in this world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i need to i need to look after my health because not because i want to live a long life but because i want to give my soul the greatest ability to express itself in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have to, and so when we think about exercise, it's not like you've got religion and then you've got exercise and then you've got your psychology. No, it's one thing. Mm -hmm. It's one thing. You exercise to look after the body. That is a gift. You go to your counselor because very real, whether it be trauma, whether it be just stuff in our own mind, whether it be relationships, all of these things, if you think about it, are, are either hampering or able to enable our soul's expression in this world. Mm. So what is marriage? Marriage is, 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 is uh, two souls being fused together. Now, if their physical lifestyle is causing that to come apart, well, then we've got a, we've got a, we've got a serious issue here. And, and, and prayer is not the solution to that. Because it may be that ego is driving this, and or it is a, a bad habit, or it is a bad memory or a trauma that's happened. Just tackle that. Pray that that works. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a it's a vehicle. Both of you are actually uh, conduits, and and both of you are coaches. Both of you are spiritual mentors that mentor people in a particular path of spirituality: the spirituality of the body, the spirituality of the mind and emotion. Just as what am I? I, I I'm a spiritual mentor. I give content. Uh, what is a chef? What is anyone? We're all actually very spiritual characters in this very perfect world. Love that. Mm. Yeah, that's spot on, isn't it? Yeah. So if, the other question you had was how we differ from other religions. I would say just get a whole lot of different religious people on. Yes, and, and start which, seeing what we say differently to one another, <laughs> which is which is really interesting that you bring that up, Menachem, because um, that's definitely on our to do list. Oh, is, good. Yes, we we actually have a plan as well. That, um, we might have to do an in person show, and we might get, you know, a, a rabbi to speak with a monk to speak with a with a, with a with a, a Christian brother, you know, and get us all having conversation because it's just so, you know, it's it's a shame we kind of have to. Cut this, cut this short because we'd love to have you back on. But it's just the, these these questions are, you know, obviously the way I see the world is is very much filtered through my own biases and childhood and projections and so forth. But I just I could listen to you talk for hours um, because as a man who's dedicated his life to understanding these traditions and the spiritual significance of of um, of these traditions and religions, it's I just. I can't help but feel like it's really missing, you know, and I and I, I kind of have some anecdotal evidence to, to prove this as well with a lot of the purpose and meaning and the existential confusion um, that comes up with a lot of the young adults that I speak to, you know, in a world that is just so abundant with um, opportunity. And, you know, Paulie and I speak about this all the time in the podcast. It's therefore um, very difficult to, to make value judgments and, and figure out what to do because you can do anything. And therefore there's no mm. meaning in anything, you know, and um, coming back to, I mean, you know, the value that I've taken from understanding some of the significance of the Old Testament and then the life of, of Jesus, um, but also, um, you know, uh, Buddha's life and how it wasn't enough for him to become enlightened. He actually had to bring, like what you were saying before, he had to come back down off the mountain and that's when the hero's journey ends. It's only after you spread the message 
Mm. That's when the journey uh, ends and therefore begins for someone else. And all of this knowledge that has shaped my life in so many wonderful ways that I can't help but feel like it's really, really missing in our society. Yes, uh, it, it is something that is missing. And I think that's that many people are either acutely aware or subconsciously aware, which is why they strive and, and gravitate towards all sorts of causes, as, as I said earlier on. Um, the religions have a bit of a bad rap, somewhat justifiably, sometimes not. I, I just lumped all religion in, in, one, in one basket. Um, but hopefully, as people tune in and they listen, uh, they'll say, oh, that person really resonates with me. I want to go and see what he or she is mm. on about. Um, there's this idea uh, in Hebrew, it's a, it's a combo of Hebrew and Yiddish, that we're in the Golis of Freiheit, that, which literally means we're in the exile of freedom, meaning the challenge that we have today is unprecedented. As a Jewish person, it's unprecedented to live in a time where we're not persecuted mm. en masse, where most countries have not only no problem with Jews, but protect religious freedom and, and, and minorities to, uh, um, and, and almost want to protect their, their um, traditions and, 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 and value that. This is unprecedented in Jewish history. But in a way, it's also quite unprecedented for humans that so much of the world has so much opportunity, you know, so much democracy, so much say in who's going to govern, so much opportunity to try to work, to try to make a living, to try to do something with some money. I'm not necessarily saying to become rich, but there is a lot more opportunity today than ever before in human history en masse. And, um, and I think as a society, we're struggling with that. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so Jewish people were, were persecuted for most of Jewish history. It's quite easy to be a Jew in a, pers in, in a times of persecution because you're, you're very limited for choice. It's survival. And religion thrives in a survival setting. So you just get on with it, you find your meaning and, and your camaraderie and your brotherhood and your sisterhood and your community, and you get chucked out and you rebuild a new life in a new country. And there are a few people who got there first and you speak Yiddish or Hebrew or whatever. It, it, and it just goes. But to, to be free and to then have the luxury of, 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 of everything, it's a, what do I, how do I find a balance? I, I, could, I could seek spirituality or I could seek money or I could seek love and pleasure. So many things. That we're actually spoilt for choice. All people are spoilt for choice. Sometimes we realize how lucky we are. Sometimes we don't realize how lucky we are. But the challenge that the world is facing, the Western world is facing today, is to manage the luxury of freedom mm -hmm. and the luxury of opportunity. And it's a it's a collective challenge. It's it's not just the rich people. It's not just the people in power. It's all of us. It's it's down to the gra the granular individual household and community and then society and, and we're struggling our way through it and and i think that there is merit in as you said there are merits in the ancient teachings of the ancient people the, the lessons that seem to have withstood the test of time may very well not only withstand the this era of time but maybe they withstood because there is wisdom mm. and there is depth and and we and we can look past our cynicism. Oh, is there a God? Isn't there a God? Let's go beyond that. Let's look at what is the wisdom teaching here? Just as the scientists did in the 80s and the 90s, uh, the 70s, the 80s, in order to de develop uh, like mindful-based stress management and things like that. They could have just said, ah, weird Asians, Indians. Uh, no, they didn't. They said, I may or may not think Buddha is a literal person, but there is wisdom here. Mm. And the wisdom is, is I believe, is the is the opportunity to take freedom and turn freedom into uh, not just a, a challenge, but the most incredible opportunity ever. We are we are potentially on the cusp of a true evolution of of the world, mm. and I think that spirituality plays a role within the freedom. It's it's amazing because it, it's such a paradox that you just described there. This new age that we live in where we're so comfortable but we're almost imprisoned by that you know yeah um it, it's a great place to kind of just uh sit and and perhaps we'll wind up the 
the chat there and possibly if you're, you're open to it, have you on another time because um, there's so much to uncover and flesh out. But um, the tenants that you've talked about um, that really you've kind of I- embraced within the way you see Judaism and um, the way people kind of are, are embracing in today's day and age. And we do, we do, have, we have a different series and set of challenges that come up where in this new world that we almost feel limitless, but are imprisoned by, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, and I look, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been incredible for you to have a chat about where you've come from, but also mm how you see Judaism kind of um, honouring, um, you know, your life and the way we can use religion uh, and spirituality to kind of grow. My pleasure. And thank you for having me. Don't let the show become too religious. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be your undoing. Like, yeah. <laughs> keep it broad. Do you have any recommendations? Like, life is more just than just a off? religious di- uh, dialogue. <laughs> that's true <laughs> no it's been awesome Menachem you're an absolute gentleman a mensch thank and, you and uh, I, I thank you very very much I'll see you both soon again in person yeah that'd yeah, be awesome love that yeah thank you so much good luck guys we'll, uh, we'll talk to you very soon thank you bye bye